All right, let's get started here. And welcome very much. This is uh, the first video cast <clears throat> that I've done as a video cast. I have done uh, two different podcasts I've done in the past and probably over 150 episodes uh, if you count them all together. But I wanted to try to do something that was a little more visual and less audio. Or, I mean, I'm gonna, so this is going to be an audio uh, as well, audio uh, podcast as well as a video cast. I'll just strip out the audio and we'll, we'll get started. Uh, this is a chance to really start to get back to um, um, putting information out there. I really enjoy that. I like putting out information to the public, so that's what this is. So um, my name is Sam Kaufman, and this particular, since it's the first one, I'm going to probably spend quite a bit of time talking about who I am, what the school is, uh, how we actually have kind of a sub part of the school as well, as you can see here from this graphic, the Herbal Medics University. Uh, my, the original school is still the school, that's it, and it's called the Human Path. Um, however, as I'll explain, um, we've branched off a little bit because we have so much uh, curriculum in the herbal, herbalism world and the, and, and the herbalism subject that we've had to actually uh, separate it. And it's, a, and it's a good thing. It's a very good thing that we've done that. Uh, so that's what we'll be talking about to start with. But we've also got a lot of other things to share. I want to talk a little bit of it today about, um, well, let's see here. What do I have lined up? Oh, first I have a word from our sponsors. But um, once we get past that, what we're going to talk about is, is, the, uh, is the school. And then we're going to talk about um, social, media, um, social media diagnosis and treatment, uh, Facebook uh, herbalism, basically. And then we're going to talk a little bit about a couple of plants, uh, specifically some plants. And I'll explain why we're doing that and how we do that. But um, before we get into that, let's have a few, moment, uh, a few moments for me to talk about the school and stuff we have coming up, because that's sort of how, well, that is exactly how uh, we pay our bills. Uh, the Apothecarist is a course that's coming up, uh, start, uh, the second semester of which is coming up next week. A uh, 12-week online course in the spring, in the winter, and then we have a 12-week uh, version of it in the fall. It's a two, it's a 24-week course, but it's divided into two semesters. So semester two is coming up, but even if you haven't taken the first semester, you can jump into the second semester. However, we highly recommend that you you have some herbal herbalism background uh, because there's no stopping to explain what a tincture is or what a you know an oxymel is or what a syrup is. Um, and so we recommend that you've gone through the herbal medic basic at our school or that you at least have some other background at another school. Uh, but that's coming up. It's an incredibly good course. It integrates um, everything from medicine making to uh, good manufacturing practices, FDA regulations, uh, to labeling, to understanding uh, how to how to make your business grow and how to make a business in the first place, uh, to how to run an apothecary in a clinic. A lot of our stuff is, of course, uh, focused towards clinical work, and so there's that too. So whether you're just a home, uh, you know, uh, you just enjoy making medicine at home, or you are a clinical herbalist, uh, everybody has something that they will gain from this course. And it's taught by three different instructors, uh, Suchel, Heather, and David, uh, and they give entirely different perspectives to all of these subjects. And it's a really cool course. Very interactive. It's online, but it's very interactive. It, of course, has an on-site portion to it too. We do intensives. Uh, there's five three-day intensives throughout about an 18-month period, and you have to do at least three of those over whatever period you need to do that. It could be years if you needed to in order to get to certification. But even if all you did was the online course, you would get a lot from it, and the intensives are great because each one focuses on a different subject. So that's coming right up. What's next do we have here? Oh, Mother Maiden, uh, Maiden Mother Crone, which is our, our Katia, uh, is our uh, instructor for this class. She is a... Um, she is a midwife with decades of experience, and especially in remote or developing nation type environments, uh, giving birth, emergency birth, all of those kinds of things. She probably has over 600 births in those kinds of environments that she's that she's been responsible for. Um, and so Katia Lamone is is out of New Mexico, but now she lives in Mexico, right now, uh, in in, in um, Chihuahua, in a, in a little town out there where we do some of our clinics, in fact, and we'll be going there this fall in, in August. Uh, but she a, runs a, um, uh, a class, <clears throat> uh, a couple of different classes, and this particular one is, is really focused towards healthcare for women, um, uh, female rep reproductive issues especially, um, also gets into pediatrics uh, a little bit, but mostly it's about female health, and uh, it ties into uh, her emergency birth class. It even ties a little bit into our doula certification that she runs all of that. 
Uh, so it's a great class. She's an amazing teacher. This is all online, but again, we also have some hands-on intensives that, that, that uh, branch off uh, from some different portions of the entire curriculum she teaches, which is a vast curriculum related to women's health, related to pediatrics, related to childbirth. Uh, so that is coming up as well. Uh, the um, uh, this one here is the uh, the functional medicine, the functional nutrition taught by Dr. Kyla Helm, who we are so fortunate to have on our curriculum, on our staff. I'm sorry, on our, not our curriculum, on our staff. Um, Kyla is an MD uh, w uh, who started out in the military. She was in the Army as a doctor, family practice. Uh, she went through med school through you know that way or paid her, paid her time back in the, or in the military, I think, and then did some extra time as well, stayed in. And then uh, when she got out, um, got into functional medicine, uh, clinical nutrition, basically, and, and functional medicine is really trying to get at the source of what is, uh, you know, of, of disease in a person, of, of the source of disease. And oftentimes it's related to, as we know, our environment, our nutrition, our lifestyle. And so that's mainly her focus. And she is, has a vast wealth of clinical experience and knowledge in the world of functional medicine. And so she shares that with us in a two-part um, nutrition course, the part one and part two, clinical nutrition one. Highly recommend this. We've had people come in who have a uh, master of science in nutrition even. I've had, we had one student do that. We've had people who've had you know, bachelor degrees, four-year degrees in nutrition. We have nutritionists come into the class who tell us, I wish I'd, I'd learned this stuff when I went through the first one. But you know, really, this is amazing how much depth that she gives this subject. Uh, so that is going on. It's just started this week. You can still jump into it. I uh, highly recommend this one. Uh, it, it's a, um, I would consider an auxiliary or a, or a um, um, you know, an, I always want to say adjuvant because that's the medical term. But basically, it's a, it's a, a term, it's a, it's a class that gives you more scope no matter what it is that you're interested in in, in regards to healthcare. Um, and then the emergency responder. This is uh, taught by Katja. Uh, who is who, who runs? So Katja Swift and, and Rin Madura run the um, uh, their their uh, New England uh, uh, or the Commonwealth School of um, of herbal medicine out in in, in Boston area, and they also have some property out in um, sort of in Western well Central Mass North uh, Mass uh, Massachusetts. It's beautiful, gorgeous property. So they do some of their classes out there as well. Uh, Katja is a phenomenal teacher as well. We're so happy to have her on our faculty. Uh, this is an online course that's three semesters long, three 12-week semesters, but it also has a hands-on or an intensive that's a five-day intensive um, that we're going to do once a year, and I think the first one we're going to start this year. Uh, and that's, that's we got a lot to, to, to talk about on that later. Um, very, very cool. So this has a lot of co-requisites with it. You need to know, um, and you're going to need to, to finish the program, you're going to have to have ham certification, ham radio certification, uh, um, technician at least. You're going to have to have... Um, um, you're going to have to have a cert certification. There's some um, some FEMA courses online that you have to do. They're all everything's free. Cert and and FEMA are free. Ham practically is free. Um, but there there you know there are things that really go in and 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 fill in all the cracks around what emergency and post disaster medicine is all about. And then we add into that, of course, through all of our other courses and through our clinical herbalism and through our foundational uh, foundation um, uh, path, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, Add into to really make this a whole picture, a big you know, big picture of somebody who is able to function uh, in a post-disaster situation as a um, healthcare, um, whatever you would want to call it. I'm not going to say healthcare provider. Technically, as an herbalist, you're not. You can't say that you're that or, or anything like that. But there are so many things that we can do with herbalism. We have done with herbalism, remote and austere medicine and post-disaster medicine that we can certainly help on many different levels. Um, and so, and you'll find the credibility of what you what you are and who you're able what you're able to do and who you are is highly related to how much information you know that is functional, practical, and that integrates with the existing uh, systems. And that's what this course really helps you do as well. So, um, lots and lots of good stuff here. Um, I could talk I could talk the entire uh, video cast just about that. Um, visit visit us online, please. You know, if you like this. Uh, um, subscribe to us on YouTube. Here's all of the stuff. By the way, all of this, uh, these these slides are going to be online in on the same uh, video and co podcast page for you to be able to download. So if you want to get these links and stuff, it'll be in a PDF uh, path, uh, uh, document for you. Um, you can get to us on YouTube.com, The Human Path, Facebook. Check us out. Check us out on Instagram if you follow us. On, uh, uh, if you follow Instagram, we have all kinds of different 
uh, photos and videos and things that will help you out there as well. All right, so that's the message from our sponsor. Today, so what I want to talk about today, um, I hope it's an interesting topic for everybody. I want to talk about, introduce myself, and uh, I feel like that's necessary to do. And I'm going to go ahead and talk about my uh, background, what I've done with the school, the start of the original uh, school that I started on this was about 23 years ago, and um, uh, what it's become, what it is, and then um, herbal medicine in general and social media. I think that I, you know, I was, I just saw some stuff the other day, and I thought, you know what? This will make a great topic uh, to jump jump into for our first um, video cast. Uh, what is practical herbalism? What does it actually mean? And then I've got we're gonna every one of these video casts. My my goal was on this to be able to give you either an herb or a skill on each one, and we can talk about that and actually get into the herb, get into the materia medica, get into the skill. Okay, so that's what we're doing today. I like this format because I can, uh, you know, with this with this particular program, this is how we teach our classes, by the way, with this sort of a format, with slides, sometimes with video, oftentimes with, with a chat, there would be a chat uh, um, box down in here so people can ask questions, a QA and a box, people can chat with each other, they can ask me questions. So if you're curious about our online courses, well, this is pretty much a similar format to that. Uh, lots of information, lots of interactivity with the students and with me as we're, as we're talking. Okay. Um, so let me just introduce myself because I know some of you that are seeing this know me, you know who I am, you've been to a lot of our classes, you know all of this stuff, so maybe you can just fast forward, you know, if you're bored to listen to me talk about myself. But I feel like at least once I should introduce myself and that's where it's going to happen is this first video cast. Um, so I grew up in a very plant literate family and by that I mean my mother was an avid gardener. We grew most of our own food through the summer that would get us through, you know, we canned a lot. We had uh, we had an orchard and apple, apple trees, pear trees, and then we had lots and lots of gardening. Uh, so I grew up in that kind of an environment. I grew up with a mother that talked to plants. You know, I grew up um, with a mother who told me, you know, at a young age that talking to plants helped them grow and made them, and then the plants she talked to that she knew that, that, that helped them out. So, I mean, I had this, this kind of a, um, a deeper connection to the plant world starting even at the age of, you know, four or five, helping and, and having to help in the garden, right, and doing that. And really, um, I think that I think that had a, an early, a very strong um, effect on me. So went through, you know, all the stuff that everybody else does, going through school and all that, and got into, went into the Army right out of high school immediately because I wanted to learn. I was really into foreign languages. I studied Russian and Latin and, and Spanish in high school. I really loved languages, and so I wanted to go to be a linguist. Um, and I also was really interested in the interrogator program because I had a friend that had gone through it, a couple of friends who had gone through it. So I ended up uh, enlisting as a, as a, at that time it was a 96 Charlie, but then they changed it to 97 Echo, which is an interrogator. Uh, went to interrogator school, you know, right out of basic training, and then went to um, DLI, Defense Language Institute. At that time, they had another branch up in San Francisco. It's in Monterey, but they had a branch for about 10 years that they opened right on the Presidio of, Ma of San Francisco, which was a beautiful place to go to school. It was an old Marine hospital right on the edge, right on the southern edge of the Presidio there. Uh, I think it was Lake Street or real close to Geary Street, right right there. And um, it was a fantastic opportunity uh, to learn language and to, uh, you know, to kind of, it was really an amazing school. Um, so I went through that, learned, uh, uh, studied German. I studied, uh, apologize for the dogs in the background. I think we have somebody that just uh, is delivering something for us. Um, studied German, and then I got to go. I actually went and was stationed in Germany and in a, in a job that required me to speak German every day. In fact, I spoke German much more than I spoke English. I hardly spoke any English for about the for the following for the rest of my, my enlistment. I lived off. It was not on a base at all. It was civilian clothes, civilian car. It was kind of like a poor man's version of James Bond, I guess. It was a lot of intelligence collection. It was called Human or Human Intelligence Collection, and that was back in in the day of kind of the last decade or so of the Cold War on the East West German border. Um, collecting that kind of information and doing a lot of translating, a lot of interpreting. And uh, I spoke, uh, I spoke, you know, I, I was very gifted in languages. And when I got done with the course, I already spoke, I would say fluent, at least conversationally fluent. I tested out, they have a DLI, they have a test. And um, the max you can get is a three, it's one, two, or three on speaking and understanding. And I, I maxed out on those. And um, and then when I got to Germany, um, I uh, didn't speak, you know, I mean, within a year, of living there, I was native. I would say native fluent in the sense that a person, if they didn't know who I was, would never be able to tell, wouldn't be able to tell at least in normal conversation, you know, for for even hours, uh, whether or not I was American. So, um, and it's, you know, of course I haven't spoken in 30 years, but 
really, but I but it's still there. And so that was my deal. I got back and got into went to college, got a degree in linguistics because it was a really easy degree for me to get. And I, I was on the GI Bill, of course. And all I cared about, honestly, was studying martial arts, which has always been one of my kind of addictions, I guess you could say, right? And um, and and working out, I you know, so I basically lived in Boulder, Colorado, and, and climbed the flat irons and ran and, and studied and worked out every day for six to eight hours a day. I'm, you know, I'm not exaggerating there, and was in incredibly good shape at that time in my life. Um, at the on you know on the paycheck of the of the military, uh, as long as I kept my grades up, you know, basically, and went to class. And I checked into class maybe twice or three times a semester. But that was back when you could get away with doing that. Um, so then I got back out, got out, uh, and went back into the military. I mean, got got done with the, my degree, went back in the military, um, into special forces, went back in the army, and uh, I decided I really wanted to learn a lot more about medicine. At that time, I was already really interested in herbalism. I had gone through a course, a, sort of a course. I have a bunch of different certifications and from different herbalism schools of that time, uh, not a bunch, two, and neither of them I'm even proud enough that I would say where they were at. But um, but you know, you got to start somewhere. And so at that time, I um, went into special forces medicine, which is very similar to being a, I would say it's somewhere between a paramedic and a PA, maybe, um, with the uh, caveat that you learn everything you learn to be able to work in, an, in what we would call an austere environment, right? So very limited supplies, uh, what we call ditch medicine, uh, you know, remote medicine, what you've got can carry on your back in your rucksack or, or you know, in your med kit or uh, what you may be able to for, be fortunate and have dropped in. Um, the nearest uh, medical director, doctor, maybe a thousand miles away. You know, so that's the kind of training it is, and it's about a year and a half if you count everything in there from airborne and you know the selection phase all the way through the you know at the back of then back then when I came in it was, was eighty nine. Um, now it's different in terms of how they break up the phases, but it was three phases back then, and so the whole thing from back to back for a medic took about a year and a half. That was if you didn't recycle. And most people did. Out of my class of 83, 13 of us made it through without recycling. And out of the whole 83, probably about half that, probably about 40, made it all the way through with recycles. And that's, and you have to remember, there was a selection phase prior to that um, that people had to get through to get there. And probably about 60% of the people didn't make it through. So about 40% make it through selection, 45, something like that at that time, I think. And then about another 50% drop out through the medic, you know, uh, don't make it through there. Now, some recycle into other MOSs, other, other, you know, there's, there's four, uh, there's four MOSs uh, on a team, uh, engineer and, and, uh, and commo and uh, medic and weapons. And so, you know, medic was really always considered kind of the, the hard one, right? Because it's the longest course and it was really took the most intellectually uh, to get through. It's a lot of material. It's a seven day a week course. Uh, sometimes, you know, in, in, by the time you get to med lab, you're working 12 to 14, 16, even 18 hour days. You're lucky to get four hours of sleep a night for four or five months in a row, or at least three months in a row during the last part of it. So it's just, it's really a grueling, grueling course. Best course I've ever done in my life. It was also the hardest and the worst course. It sucked worse than anything I've ever done in my life, I would say. And I've done a lot of things that really sucked, but that one was tough. So I've had an EMTB probably two or three times. I'm actually and and I've you know let it go. I've I had the I've done the paramedic equivalency stuff, uh, an ACLS, PHTLS, PLS PALS, all the skills exams. Um, I'm going to go back and actually get my paramedic uh, in the next couple of years here uh, because I just I want to get that. Uh, I need to have that certification. So it's you know you just have to have that in your hand regardless of how much training you've had. But but that's kind of my background medically. That whole time now remember that whole time I was learning all of this stuff. And working in clinics and working in, in, in uh, troop medical clinics and working in the field with the teams and working uh, back in hospitals and ERs, that whole time in the back of my head, in the front of my head sometimes, I was always, always working with herbalism to me. Now, that doesn't mean I was ever working with plant medicine in the military with other, mili with other people, but for family, uh, for friends, for even for people on my team who were interested in it, um, that was always my... My goal was to try, to try to figure out how all of this medical information, how do I actually integrate it now with herbalism, with plant medicine, because that's what I really cared about. Uh, I'm a registered herbalist with the American Herbalist Guild, just kind of a peer-reviewed system that's uh, it's a good system uh, to, to be able to, to determine whether a person has a clinical background in herbalism or not enough to be able to, to, to join that, you know, that, uh, that guild as a, as a professional registered herbalist. Um, I would say 
probably over 13 years that I've been seeing and working with people clinically, not always full-time. That's not always been full-time, but some of it's been very much full-time. Some of it's been more than full-time. And there are certainly, since we've done the school in San Antonio, um, there are times where it's just crazy full-time. So, I mean, thousands, I've had thousands of clients. If you consider everybody who's come into my clinic where I'm the clinical director, thousands, maybe 10,000, I don't know, so the thousands of, of, of verbal clients over that this period of years. So, um, so a lot of that has has translated into, you know, experience for me that that I feel like I can I can really give to people now as a teacher, and that's important to me. And I've been teaching for over 25 years. And special forces, one of the things that was really big in special forces was teaching you to be a teacher. And um, and you know, SF guys were really good at teaching because we had to do a lot of it. I taught a lot of you know law enforcement. You know, whether it was medicine or, or door kicking, you know, direct action stuff, uh, hostage rescue, oh, SWAT teams, uh, both regional, local, I mean, you know, local or state or, or um, even federal, uh, you know, BATF worked with SWAT teams. I mean, all kinds of different people that, that you're teaching, uh, everything from <clears throat> tactics and, you know, small unit tactics all the way to medicine and field medicine and, and, uh, and everything in between that, that we do in SF. So um, I learned how to teach that way. And, um, I love it. I love Special Forces gave me that, and I'm very grateful to my time in Special Forces and to the people that I worked with for that. Um, <clears throat> I was teaching. I was really into wilderness survival then. I, I was into wilderness survival before I went back in SF, and I've been into martial arts way before then. So when I got to the SF portion of those things, it was kind of a joke to me, uh, just because I'd been spending so long with that anyway. So to me, starting a friction fire was not that big a deal. Uh, you know, setting up a shelter and can't and you know, all those things were really things that I'd been doing. Uh, so I started teaching. Uh, I started my first school about 23 years ago, or more than that. It was uh, 1990. Uh, well, when would it have been? 92, I think. Yeah, the summer of 92. Or maybe it was 93. Now, summer of 92, I think I started teaching. And uh, um, started the school at the time. It was called the uh, Dalgoon School of Living Arts. And then um, that didn't do so well. It was not, you know, the time was not right. But I didn't have the experience for it. Uh, to do it anyway. I didn't have the resources to teach. And then uh, later on, I started another one. It was called the Earth Mind Center. And uh, that did okay. It was kind of a mix between survival and martial arts and then herbalism and, and herbal medicine. So I've been doing that for quite a while, right? And it's been, and it's really, this is, Human Path is the third iteration of my schools. And um, it's the one that's really, um, it's, it's ready. It's, it's, this is it. This is the one. This is the one I'll do until the day I die. Um, so that's where I'm at. Oh, I guess I already said I started my first school in 1993. I guess I should just looked at my own notes there. Yeah, and that's that's probably I've sat down and figured that out. And uh, yeah, martial arts has always been a big part of that. I studied. God, I started, you know, when I was 13, you know, and I could bike. I paid for everything myself, and uh, so I had to. And the only martial arts school that I could, schools I could go to was our kung fu school, and there was a, a, a sort of a Korean martial arts that was similar to taekwondo, and. Uh, so those were my first kind of things. And I got into um, no holds barred, like mixed martial arts when it first started back in the very beginning days of the UFC. And, um, you know, when the Gracies kind of started that whole thing up and uh, fought amateur a little bit enough to learn that, you know, by then I was old enough to where I realized, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't you know, just jump into something and get hit in the head every day and, and expect to get, you know, to, to continue without brain damage. So I got out of that, you know, that and, and just got more into things like grappling and, and so that's really my big enthusiasm now is Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. But um, I really, I enjoy it. I've always enjoyed martial arts, and I've enjoyed the connection between the body and the mind. Uh, I was very much into Qigong and Tai Chi and breathing exercises, and that got me through Special Forces uh, a qualification course, the SFQC. That got me through, and it got me through the selection phase without any injuries, and I was at the top of my class. I was probably in the top five people in uh, every event going through selection, I was a great runner. I ran cross country in high school and I got, you know, and so I was a good, I had a lot of, of just basic cardio fitness and did a lot of martial arts. And so um, I was working out enough to where all of that started to make sense and the breathing really started to really be a part of that too. So what we would call now maybe core muscle training or what used to be called inner, like, you know, the, the inner tennis and inner running and all those books that came out back then. Um, I was doing that stuff through Qigong and, and you know, breathing exercises before those books ever came out. And I'm not saying that, you know, that was being done thousands and thousands of years before me. That's where I learned it from, of course. But I'm just saying that these things kind of pick up and they become trendy and they become something that sells. Um, but know that these these concepts have been around for a long, probably as long, definitely as long as human, human humanity has been around. 
Okay, so that's all about me, about the school a little bit, survival. Uh, you know, this is, uh, the whole idea was how do I take all of these things and put them together? How do I take everything and put it together in something that makes sense, right? And so that's what it ended up being is we, we uh, I started off with these paths. And then what ended up happening was the, the herbalism path uh, the, off of the medic has grown so much because there's so much curriculum. We have, we have at least 1,500 hours of online curriculum right now across all these different herbalism paths, at least. And so that needs its own separate thing. So we have the Herbal Medics University was the place to put all of that. It's like you have a house and it's so filled with stuff, so filled with things that you've got to start to organize and you take all of everything from that has to do with the thing that you do the most and all your books maybe, whatever, and you build a library for those books because that's where they need to be. And that's kind of what's happened with Herbal Medics University. It's sort of our library. It, is the, it used to be that we were a survival school that taught a lot of herbal medicine, and now we're really an herbal medicine school that teaches some survival. And the survival we teach is all related to things that um, uh, things that uh, support the um, actual herbalism path. And the herbalism path for us is what can we do on the ground as clinical uh, herbalists? And this means remote austere medicine. So it's like taking all the herbalism and all the special forces stuff and putting it together into this uh, vision that helps people who are underserved. It helps people from remote areas. It helps people who are in the middle of the city or anywhere that they're underserved. And I got news for you. Pretty much everybody, middle class and lower in the United States is medically underserved. So we help everybody. You know, it's not just people who are really, really poor. We've done this in Nicaragua. We've done this in Mexico. We do it in places, other places besides the U.S., but we're really kind of focusing more on the U.S. now, and I want to focus on the, on the U.S. a lot more now. So that, so how can we do that and, and have all the herbalism stuff at the same time we have the skills it takes to just set up a clinic? Or what we find time and time again if we start to study the epidemiology of an area before we go in is we've got issues with clean water, right? So the clean, there's no clean water. Well, how do we purify water? And we've been doing that for quite a while. And so we have an entire section on uh, off-grid power and clean water and building using, you know, using, uh, reusing and recycling that type of building and um, setting things up. And that's our primitive engineering. So let me just show you a really quick video on that. And then that should explain the foundation paths. I don't have a video on Herbal Medics University yet because there's, there's actually five different herbalism paths. I'm making one on that. And we'll get into that later. So that's the herbalism piece. But um, let's just go back to the foundation paths. These are all the things that support our herbalists in the field. And so you can get in there. You can, you can be a clinical herbalist through a certification through our school. But then you really you might find that, you know what? We go out in these places, and I can't even tie a, a knot to, to tie a load down on the back of a truck. That's our, you know, and I don't know how to pack stuff. And I don't know how to plan. And I don't even know where we're going exactly and how much it's going to cost and what it's going to be and what, who's going to provide our food. All of those questions get answered in the foundation paths. And so let me go ahead and show that quick video on that before we move on. Here's the foundation paths themselves, the four paths of the off-grid engineer, medic, provider, and scout. And then let's just go ahead and show this video. So I'm going to uh, put the video on, which means I have to stop sharing uh, this particular page. And you'll see you go gray for just a second. And then I'll go ahead and put on a, uh, a video. It's a four-minute video. Aside from the diverse herbalism studies at our school, we also offer training in four different foundation paths that teach essential skills related to self-sustainable medicine and nutrition, teamwork, leadership, and community. These foundation paths offer many different courses that can be taken on their own or as part of a full certification in order to be able to work and be part of herbal medics teams in the field. So, what are the four foundation paths exactly? Number one, the off-grid engineer. Off-grid engineers are the master problem solvers on a team who build water catchment and purification systems, create off-grid power, build or modify structures often using limited or recycled resources, understand transportation, hygiene and sanitation, general logistics, loading and packing vehicles and trailers, metalworking, blacksmithing, and many other engineering concepts that support an herbal medic's team's medical and educational mission. Number two, the medic. The medics on a team are trained in wilderness first responder skills, as well as basic herbal medicine. 
Their role on the team is to understand how to plan for, set up, and run a clinic. This includes first aid, basic herbalism, tactical medicine, self-awareness and sports physiology, self-defense, and basic epidemiology. This path is separate from our herbalism programs, but many of our herbalism students also certify in the path of the medic in order to add much more practical foundation to their herbalism, plus the ability to perform under stress and work with a team. Number 3. The Provider The providers on the team are experts in keeping the team healthy, as well as creating and teaching about sustainable food solutions for small communities. They have to understand nutrition, first aid, team planning for food, water, and health, sustainable backyard agriculture, food preparation and preservation, foraging and survival cooking in urban and remote environments. Number 4. The Scout Scouts must be able to plan a mission from start to finish. This begins most commonly by researching culture, language, location, economy, health care issues, nutrition, clean water, and other related problems both through conversations and online. This path also involves visiting the community in order to understand their specific healthcare related needs. Scouts must understand security concerns and route mapping, particularly in the case of post disaster and foreign countries, ingress and egress routes, transportation, political and legal stability, map reading and orienteering, reconnaissance, linking up team members, basic survival escape and evasion and long-distance movement across both urban and wilderness environments are all part of the scout training. Students at Herbal Medics University learn and gain experience in several ways. They study through our highly interactive online courses, but they also learn and practice hands-on skills at our 50-acre campus in beautiful hill country near San Antonio, Texas. This often includes reality-based scenario training, most importantly, students can apply their skills in the real world by participating as part of herbal medics teams in the USA or abroad, helping medically underserved communities in remote, urban, and post-disaster locations. Herbal medics teams are made up of students who have studied one or more of the four foundation paths, as well as herbalism students. Team members work together cohesively in different environments, from urban to remote to post-disaster, to create herbal clinics, self-sustainable medicine and food solutions, first aid, clean water, off-grid power, construction, and other solutions for communities who want and need that help. For more information, check out www.thehumanpath.com or www.herbalmedics.university. See if it comes back up to the page we left. Yes, so there's our foundation pass. Okay, so enough about me, hopefully in the school now. That was quite a long, quite a long little journey we went on there to talk about the school, Herbal Medics University. We haven't really talked about all of those even all of those paths. There's five paths of herbalism too, um, that are all about herbalism. That's a whole other section. Maybe we'll do that, tackle that another time. But the foundation paths, herbal medics or the, the human path.com, where we started, where I started out at, where this all came from. Uh, so hopefully that gives you a nice, you know, kind of idea. If you know if you're interested in what it is I'm doing, both whether it's just all you're doing is listening to this video cast and video casts in the future that give you information, or whether you're into you've done a few of our classes or you're coming in and you're a full-time you know student, you take all of our classes, whatever level you're at, um, I think it always helps to know what the history is behind who's teaching and the school itself and who's who founded. You know, I'm the person that founded this school. Uh, of course, we have many many teachers, but um, this gives you at least my background. So. What are we going to talk about? Let's talk about, um, I already talked about the fact that I used to have podcasts out, right? And I feel like video is just really, really um, a better way to go. So you're going to have video and audio. Like I said, this is not just a video cast. It's also a podcast for those who don't want to watch the the, the, the uh, MP4 or the, the video. Um, and then uh, try to do a couple, three to four uh, topics each podcast or each video cast and probably be about an hour long or less each time. Uh, we'll have a skiller plan of the day. And then I'm um, definitely going to do, so probably even the next one we'll be doing uh, uh, something with either Katja or, or Kyla, somebody, uh, probably one of our instructors. Katja has a lot of stuff coming up with the emergent responder, and I'd like to talk to her on a couple subjects. She's a lot of fun to talk to, so probably that'll be the next one. Uh, so we're always talking to other people. It's not always just going to be me by myself. Okay, But the idea here is to give you guys information. 
all kinds of information. All right, let's get into the topic of herbalism and social media. So I saw this um, post, like I said, so it's all over, right? Facebook is probably the biggest culprit of this. But you get all of these pages where people are coming in and asking, you know, uh, important uh, medical conditions that they have, very sometimes very dangerous medical conditions, and you get answers that range from from practical to, you know, and, and maybe you know at least making some sense to just absolutely asinine, completely asinine. Okay, usually it's the herbalism pages, the homeopathy pages. You see this, you see this with first aid stuff. Even some there's some first aid pages I've seen like this, natural medicine stuff. Integrative medicine pages sometimes, essential oil pages are, can be the worst. Um, and you just get these people who had, they just come up and ask a single question. And you're, and if you, if you, so imagine you went to a doctor or you went to somebody who you would expect to be able to help you, or you went to an actual good clinical herbalist who knew what they were doing. And you went in and said, hey, what's a good herb for this? Do you think they would just give you an herb and let you walk out? Of course not. You would have to, you know, we take a history, right? In, in orthodox medicine, we would do at least a soap note and find out what are your symptoms, right? What's the subjective? What's the objective? And then try to assess it and try to di rule out other things, either through testing or through the history itself, the clinical history that you're taking, um, or obs observation or, or listening, auscultation, or, I mean, whatever it is you might be doing to figure that out. So we get these, you know, this is a, a good example of a ridiculous question. What's a good herb for gangrene, <laughs> right? You know, so you've got grand green. Is that what you're saying? I mean, really, seriously, this is where you're turning to for that. That's the first question that comes out of, uh, to my mind. And then, you know, and then you get just people re responding with ridiculous statements, you know, and I'm not far. This is not this might sound like satire, but I guarantee you I've seen things this ridiculous. You know, I cured grand green with with onions, you know. <laughs> So, and I, I bet you there's probably any somebody watching this video cast right now saying, hey, man, I've done that. I've cured cured gangrene with my, my best friends, sisters, uncles, second-in-law, uh, wife, cousin, third cousin, once removed, did that, and it saved his life, you know. So, I'm sorry if it's insulting you, but it's just absolutely asinine. So, I actually took, took some screenshots just to give you an idea. What are some of the things we see? Okay, so oregano, all right, so, you know, oregano oil, right? Colloidal silver. <laughs> Um, yeah, and I'm sorry, I'm probably pissed. You know, this this is going. To, I'm gonna to have to tell you right now, my video casts are always gonna probably have some controversy in them. So you're gonna either, and, and it's typical with me, people either love me or they hate me. Usually, there's not very much middle ground. Um, but trust me, these first two answers are bullshit. Okay, and I apologize. I'm gonna to try to watch my language too. My first podcast series really had a problem with that, and I really, you know, I, I used to cuss like a sailor on those, and I'm not doing that anymore. But there's no better word to describe this than. Pardon my French, bullshit, okay? Uh, tea tree and salt, um, well, we're getting a little closer there. Propolis, okay, maybe. Tea tree, mm. uh, um, you know, so these are things that might make a person, they might, you know, have a little bit of, um, you know, uh, um, symptomatic help. They might be, you know, um, they, so they, they might be palliative treatment and to help it feel, help the throat feel a little better for a few minutes. Right, but what's the problem with strep throat? So this, by the way, this was off a question about strep throat. I don't know if I said that. Strep throat was the question, and the person actually gave a little bit of information. They said, "Okay, it's my kid. They've had a fever of 101.5. They are really sick. They're getting a little bit of nausea. They've I don't even know if they went any further than that. But what are the things we look for for strep throat? Well, there's a lot, right? But we strep throat is pretty definitive, and you can tell it. I know people want to go get a culture, but a good doctor or person, anybody clinical herbalist uh, mother who has uh, experience will be able to diagnose strep throat between the pharyngitis, the lymphadenopathy the, 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 that you're going to get in the front, right, the submandibular the, 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 that you're going to find, the anterior uh, lymphadenopathy, the um, petechia sometimes, the, the little red dots that you're going to see back there along with the, larynge with the pharyngitis, the redness. Uh, there is a distinctive smell to, to strep throat. And if you've ever smelled it, you probably remember it. It's pretty bad, but you remember that. Every bacteria has their own smell generally. So we'll get that, you know, to get that smell. Um, you get, with children, you sometimes do get the nausea. It's true. Um, a little bit of nausea in there. Um, there's, uh, there's definitely going to be a fever. There's you oftentimes exudate, patches of exudate. So we've got all these things. And, and um, the good news is with, with herbalism is that we can actually do something about it. Now, do I say we should do something about it? Well, this is one of those red flag type of type of illnesses. It's an acute illness that can certainly present problems if you don't take care of it, right? This can become uh, scarlet fever. You can get you can get uh, the, the this particular bacteria can end up uh, migrating and attacking the heart. It can even attack other parts of the body as well. And so we can end up uh, with with uh, 
issues down the road that are very, very serious. So what we have to do here is be really cognizant of that. And if we can't help it within a matter of, of I would say, hours, as in 24 hours, any time, and I've probably worked with, I would say, roughly over, over two dozen times over the last 20 years or something, I've probably worked with strep throat. That includes, that's including my own family. It's including myself, but, you know, back in the, back in the very beginning. Um, uh, I've had strep throat, uh, and, I've, and I've worked with it um, for myself as well. That's usually what herbalists end up doing. They start off with family and start off with loved ones and start off with their friends, right, and, and, and themselves. And then, then they move from there. That's usually where, because that's the system, right? That's, we don't have uh, residency programs and internship programs like we should. We don't have clinics the, the, the nearly in the number that we should and clinical herbalism programs nearly in the number that we should. So anyway, my point is within about 24 hours, always my, my line was, okay, if they don't, from 24 hours from now, doing this particular protocol that we're working with, if they're not feeling better, then it's time to go to the doctor, okay? Because we need to get this taken care of as quickly as possible, right? Within several days, we end up with biofilms. We end up with all kinds of damage coming off of that. The attacks I talked about, the fact that these this bacteria can attack other parts of the body, right? Um, so anyway, uh, I think some people actually pointed this out uh, in a few places on here, and I might even be uh, here. But I just wanted to show you. So all of these different, um, uh, you know, advice for something that is potentially, actually, at least in the future, life-threatening. You know, we've got people giving all kinds of advice. And I took, bare, this was probably not even a third of all of the, I've got a whole bunch of them, and it's probably not even a third of all of the different advice that you got. Look up here, prayer, okay? I'm sorry if this offends anybody who's religious about this, but I'm, I'm sorry. But you got strep throat, prayer is not the answer, okay? Another controversial statement, if you don't like that attitude, I mean, you're probably not going to like me. Um, so here's somebody who actually saw, let the doctor take a look. Um, and then we get lots of garlic, you know, and garlic. You know, so garlic is a great herb for certain things. It's It works for certain things. It, it's not a good herb for this. It's not going to really do much for the strep throat. I'm sorry. Um, here's a good one. I love this line. Um, strep. So here somebody points out the, what I just talked about. So strep can go to the mitral valve and do damage pretty quickly. Antibiotics will kill the strep bacteria. True. Very true statement, right? Respectfully, they make the symptoms disappear because, oh, this is because, uh, yeah, I'm sorry. It all started right here. First of all, strep throat needs to be diagnosed. That's where it all went, right? So then this person says, um, uh, yeah, I'm planning to get to the doctor. I was just looking for something to get by. And, you know, that's a very fair statement. This person who posted, you know, there's nothing wrong with this, in my opinion. It's, they posted on a site that's all about this. This is a Facebook site for that. It's a page specifically for this, right? And this person, uh, bless their heart, they're like, you know, they gave some information, some good information, and they're saying, look, I was I just trying to see if I could get something to hold her over until tomorrow, right? Um, and so then we get people that are coming with things like try to avoid antibiotics and just make the symptoms <laughs> disappear. <laughs> yeah, that would be called actually, you know, getting rid of the getting rid of the uh, the infection. That's why the symptoms disappear. And somebody says that um, strep can go to the mitral valve and do damage. And then uh, you can't see the names here, so it's kind of hard to tell who's doing the back and forth exactly. But um, but this person says, yeah, they make the symptoms disappear because they start to kill the strep bug and it heals it. it your body heals itself. Untreated uh, strep can lead to severe heart disease. Um, and then this person, the same person says, well, yeah, but it kills your gut floor as well. Yeah, that's true. Band -band 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 uh, antibiotics do that. But this person points out very wisely, if strep destroys your heart, you won't have be around to worry about gut flora. Gut flora can be replaced with proper nutrition and proper probiotics. Another very true statement. And the answer to this, if you had proper gut flora, you wouldn't have strep, right? I mean, you know. Anyway, uh, so those were some of the different things we saw. So what's my point to all of this, you know, this ranting on this and probably, you know, upsetting a few people, um, is uh, to be aware of this and to understand. So depending on what you're watching this for, you might be watching it because you, you're kind of curious. Like, I've never, I'm not really familiar with herbalism. Let's see if this guy actually knows something about what he's talking about, okay? Or you might actually be an herbalist who's watching this. It doesn't matter what your level of experience and what your level of knowledge is. Um, you know, you wouldn't go to, um, well, you might, <laughs> but you probably shouldn't, go to anybody on the street, you know, literally a random person on the street and ask them to fix your car, right? Or to, um, uh, you know, or if you broke, let's say you broke your arm, you know, you wouldn't go or you had strep throat. You wouldn't just walk up to a person on the street and say, hey, could, what would you do for this, right? That wouldn't necessarily be the most 
you could, but it wouldn't necessarily be the best way to get the answer that you wanted, a, a good answer. You get an answer, but it wouldn't necessarily be the right answer or a good answer. Uh, so it's the same thing. You just have to have to understand that. And um, I don't even, you know, other than to look in sometimes on these things, and I, I guess I'm still on a few. I've gotten rid of most of the ones I'm on completely, uh, but there's a few that I'm still on. And for some reason, I get, I, you know, I'm following them, and I need to unfollow them, I think, because it, it's just irritating to me. But I, I go and I see these things like, man. But I do have my own Facebook pages, and we do get people that post on those pages and those groups that say, hey, what's about, what about this and this? And I try to keep that as practical and as sane as in common sense as possible. So if there's something that came up like this on my page, I would be heavily governing it. And I would say, look, you know, this prayer that's going out, I'm sorry, deleting this. And if you have a problem with it, I'll delete you, or you know, ban you off of this page because that's not an answer that gives, does anybody any good. Right. This is a disease. This is a this is a, an infection. This is a potentially life threatening infection. So you have to um, understand that this uh, kind of information overload is out there. And we really find it in a lot of very trendy areas where people are making money off of things like essential oils and multi-level marketing, where they're, where they're spewing out a lot of information that is, for lack of a better word, complete garbage. OK, so be aware of that, please. And this is not to sit here and tell you I have all the answers because I certainly don't, right? But at least I will guarantee you I will I know what my red flags are. And I've made mistakes in the past like everybody has, both in orthodox medicine and ERs and working with docs. And I've been around docs making mistakes. Everybody makes mistakes, right? And the first rule of medicine is if you mess up, fess up, right? And then that's to yourself as well as to the people that, that it's affected. Um, but... That list is a very short list compared to the list of people that I have helped. A very short list. You know, we're talking something that can probably we could say maybe in a, in the range of a dozen or two dozen versus thousands of people that have either been helped or at least not gotten worse. You know, that's the first rule of medicine is don't do any harm. And the problem is with the Facebook and with the social media is there is a huge potential to do harm. So you have to be really aware of that. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about practical herbalism. Let's look into the plant of the day. Practical herbalism is what I'm all about. It's what the school's all about. It's what I really think is the starting place for anybody. We need to know first aid. That's not herbal first aid necessarily. That's just basic first aid. Then we can, can range in from there. We can go into herbal first aid. Understand just these acute uh, infectious disease processes. What are they? And just how do we deal with cold flus and with the flea, flu season, rather? The um, you know viral uh, viral infections, so which is something that herbs can handle and deal with and help our body heal from very well a lot of times, right? Um, and then of course into that nutrition, lifestyle, and and as it affects chronic disease and as it affects our propensity or our weakness to become ill in the first place from acute infections like colds and flu flus and UTIs and stomach uh, stuff, right? Um, practical herbalism also has to include some form of medicine making and understand how do you make your medicine, right? That is a, that's an entire separate thing. So even in our, our herbal medic basic, we send out herbs to the students and they make you know a basic percolation tincture and they make a basic uh, where they make several percolation tinctures and they make a syrup and they make a salve, um, and that's really basic. But in our pot, we expand on that and do 24 weeks of of advanced medicine making along with several different um, Intensive. Sorry, <clears throat> got a little bit of a <clears throat> talking here, a little bit too much. <clears throat> Throat's getting dry. So, um, also you need to understand your local bioregion. What what are the plants in your own backyard? Because those are the ones that's sustainable medicine. What are you growing in your own garden? That's what the key behind all herbalism really is. Is it's a medicine of the people and it's sustainable, and everybody should know something about it, if not a lot about it. So we get into gardening and get into wildcrafting there too. So these are kind of, you know, I just wanted to draw out, this is my list of the most important pieces of the puzzle in my mind to learning practical herbalism. And on that note, let's learn something. Let's learn about an herb of the day. And so I, I actually want two herbs here of the day. And, and if you count all the species, there's many more than two. Um, let's talk about the Mahoney species. Let's talk about Oregon grape and let's talk about Algorita. So I've got all these botanical names. So you may or may not be, you know, want to hear about that. Um, I don't have the, I didn't write out the common names. I apologize for that. I'm going to write them out right now. So we're talking about um, two herbs here. The first one, Oregon grape. And the second one is called, commonly called Algarita. Or also, it's got many names, right? It's um, 
Algorita is Agarito. It's called Desert Barberry. I apologize for not having the common names up on this. I originally did this as a as a movie, but it just was too big. I went out and took a movie of my own plants in the yard, and because you know I could get a really good macro movie, I have a good camera for that. Uh, but and that, that's where I had the common names. But I took that out because it just took too long to play to load up and everything. So um, anytime we see that SPP, by the way, for those of you who aren't familiar with that, that's abbreviation for species. So there's so uh, you know we we organize our plants in genus and family and and you know go, going all the way up from kingdom all the way down to species and even subspecies. And so the species is what you know is usually what we talk about to delineate these these herbal these herbal plants. That tells us the difference. And then uh, the genus, the next level above that in taxonomy is is, is the next one up. So this is Berberis or Mahonia. Don't worry about the difference between the two. It's botanists fight about it, and every couple of years they decide something different. So it's <clears throat> all of these plants are commonly called barberries. So the, the barberry plants. So there's there's all kinds of different barberries. There's Japanese barberry, and there's there's several different barberries, and one of them is desert barberry, which grows all over the place in central Texas and in the southwest, other species of it that, that are called the same common name. And then we've got Oregon grape, which some of you, many, maybe many of you, are, or maybe all of you are familiar with Oregon grape, uh, but Oregon grape has several different species as well. There's low ones, there's higher ones. So the ones that I've got in my backyard here, this is actually called leatherleaf uh, mahonia, or it's, um, it's got other names like a... Bialii uh, Mahonia, I think, or B or Bialii uh, uh, Barberry, or something like that. It's basically the same plant. If you look at this, uh, it's difficult to even tell from this picture if this is just Oregon grape, which is the Aquifolium species, or if it's a Bialii. Uh, it doesn't matter. They're all the same. They're all medicinally equivalent, really, in my opinion. Um, the ones I use are this. I use the Aquifolium. I use the Repins up in Colorado. That was my favorite. I'm, I'm originally from Colorado. Um, and that's a low-growing kind of little prostate uh, one that's very nice and very effective. I love that plant. And it grows, it's, per, it's very prolific, too. Um, so we use the, this is a great plant. So we use the root of this plant, right? And we use the, um, um, uh, sometimes we use the stem, and then we use the leaf. And then we use them for different things. So let me go ahead and step in, because I think I've got, uh, oh, I guess I don't. I thought I had that all listed out. So uh, the pieces of this plant that we use for Oregon grape. Um, or, or for algorita. We use the root, and we can use the lower stem, and then we use the leaf. Okay, that's medicinal. Now, the berries are actually edible. Both of, of all the organ grapes, in my opinion, uh, you know, all the ones I've eaten are edible, and then the algorita is very much edible, and it's delicious. It's kind of like a, it's almost like a rhubarb, but a sweeter, sweeter version of a rhubarb. We have these red berries, so I'll just jump ahead here real quickly to algorita, and we'll talk about that in a second. But these red berries, very delicious. Make great jams and make great pie. Um, you can make sauces like ice cream sauce out of them. Incredible, incredible berry, wonderful taste. And the same thing here. These kind of have a little bit of a bitter, more bitter taste to them. But I've eaten them. I back in my days when I used to practice all my primitive skills in the mountains. This was one of my staples. I didn't eat a lot of them at a time. You shouldn't. Not raw. You should cook them. But I would eat small amounts of them, and it was very nourishing. Um, but back to the medicinal. This is what we use. We use the root and the lower stem and the leaf, right? Um, so the root, now we don't use them for all the same things. The root and the lower stem are really high in, a, in a, an alkaloid that's called berberine. Berberine uh, is one of many constituents. Every plant has thousands of constituents, but it's one of many constituents that seems to be very responsible for the antimicrobial properties of this plant. So what do we use the root of these and, and the lower stem of? Well, if you cut the root and the lower stem, you'll see them, they're very yellow. And that yellow is the color of the berberine, right? Now, um, berberine became famous because it uh, back in the late 60s because it was used to wipe out a cholera epidemic in India in, uh, at the time. There was a big cholera epidemic, and the one thing that worked really well was golden seal. Golden seal has berberine in it too, by the way. So a lot of research was done. And they realized that, wow, you know, this is really, it's an anti-infective, but it also is an anti-inflammatory in the gut. It helps the gut heal. It's a very good mucosal, uh, what we quite call a mucosal vulnerary or a gut healer for the, the, uh, for the gut mucosa itself, right? As well as being anti-infective, it's also a little bit of a cholagog. It helps stimulate the liver 
and that helps the digestion. It's a bitter, a very strong bitter, and so it helps digestion in general. So we can use it for a lot of things. We can use uh, both the um, Oregon grape here and the next one, uh, the Berberis trifoliata, the Algarita. So this is Algarita and this uh, uh, up here, and this is Oregon grape back here. Um, I apologize again for not having the common names on these slides, but um, we use the root very, uh, we can use it fairly similarly. Now it's not, we could get into depth on this. I could talk for two hours about each one of these and you would see there's a lot of differences, but just the basic similarities are, they will both be effective for, as an anti-infective for every kind of, for lots of different bacterial infections. We talked about strep throat. Well, if you could get this herb to the back of the throat and get it to stay there, um, then it'll help strep throat, right? The problem is getting the herb to the tissue and that's always, that's a, that's a, always a problem right uh, so it doesn't berberine doesn't travel into the bloodstream very well from the gut is, is one of the problems we, there are things we can do to enhance that but it but it's so it's, it's better for things in the gut or wounds so if you have a wound infection for instance that we can put the the herb directly on right if we could put the herb on an infection of a laceration we, we cut ourselves and then three days later we had an infection on there um, then this would be one of those that we could drip we could take the herb and we can drip that down onto the wound itself through you know putting it maybe in a four by four what we call a poultice basically and, and getting that all wet and letting it drip into that um, you can even pull uh, put a plaster on there we actually put the, the herb directly in touch with or in contact with the skin right we can there's a lot of different ways we can apply these things but primarily I would like you to take from this to think of this as an anti-infective anti-inflammatory for the gut and um, uh, especially for the gut and for the mucosa in general and then a bit a good bitter and a collagog or something that helps the liver um, helps the liver do better job of what it what it does in terms of producing bile and helping the digestion and freeing up a lot of the um, the problem that can kind of come from a congested liver a congested liver is something that happens through our diet through the toxins in our diet and the liver just becoming overwhelmed at what it does which one of many of hundreds of tasks it does which is to de uh, detoxify our blood right and so are uh, we eat something and and then all of that uh, most of that uh, those those nutrients as well as the toxins that need to get de broken down and they get broken down enough to where they end up in the portal vein and go into the liver and the liver has to then really detoxify and it has these stages that it goes through to be able to do that well this is one of those herbs that helps enhance that and to some degree and also enhance the body's ability to create bile that flows back down into the gut into the small intestine to be able to help break down those things in the first place especially a lot of the different fats and proteins so we end up with a better digestion because of that which increases which and and, and, and think of like having a sort of a log jam in the liver you know being able to free that up to some degree and um, help that sort of uh, cycle between the liver to the small intestine or you know the bile duct to the small intestine back around to the portal vein back into the liver so this whole cycle that we get there this helps that cycle and it that can be a cycle that creates all kinds of things like skin problems people have eczema and autoimmune issues um, I've used um, um, organ grape for a lot it's very good for those types of things often oftentimes good for those types of things um, not so much the algorita, I don't use it for that, but the, the organ grape very much so. So like I told you, there's definitely some differences that we start to get, and there's some subtle differences. Mahonia is less, uh, organ grape is less of an intense berberine, you know, blast. Algorita is just an intense berberine blast, very, very potent berberine. Bright, bright yellow, highly bitter, and a really strong gut gut herb and a really strong anti-infective we use it every time we go down to places like nicaragua or belize or mexico and have to work in you know in the remote areas there where we and end up you know if a person gets uh drinks some bad some water that you know has uh you know some either bacterial or even even protozoal you know even giardiasis um you know cryptosporidium um uh, even a viral you know just a, just like a, even a uh, any kind of a, a inflammation or um, upset uh, you know diarrhea and vomiting of really kind of unknown origin um, this is one to go to to move to towards that for to, to help with that the leaf also I mentioned the leaf is medicinal in algorita I use it as an anti nozzle now it's not the leaf doesn't have any berberine in it or very little if you taste it it's actually more of a tart than it is a bitter and uh, so I use the leaf of this a lot for anti nozzles and also for wound healing for um, anti-infective and the same is true of the leaf here 
You can take this and dry it and powder it and use it for wound healing. It's very high in another molecule that's very important to know, or uh, constituent rather, that's important to know about that's called MHC, 5'-methoxyhydrocarbon, uh, which is a, which is a, um, um, uh, inhibits um, certain bacteria's ability to defend itself, right, through what's called efflux pumping. So a whole other topic there, but just know that this leaf itself uh, contains high amounts of that in order to be able to help uh, the effectiveness of the root. So if you could think about it, the root is an antibacterial in a lot of ways. Well, the leaf actually increases the effectiveness of that antibacterial for certain bacteria, especially things like MRSA, like methicillin-resistant uh, uh, you know, uh, staph aureus. Um, it increases the effectiveness of the root by up to like 14 or 15 times, as you know, some research shows. So uh, very useful uh, that way, and it just by itself, as uh, even ground and powdered as a wound, uh, a wound healer, it works pretty well, the leaf of this particular plant. And uh, this one, too, I would argue. But this one, primarily, the Algarita leaf, I use mostly as an anti-nauseal. I would say more than anything else. Um, so that is, I'm trying to kind of talking fast to try and get everything crammed in here. I know we're going a little bit over an hour, uh, but I wanted to at least, you know, give you some input on these plants. Uh, hopefully that, that's helpful. Um, every uh, video cast, we'll talk about a plant or a skill. We have lots and lots of skills out there, everything from athletic um you know, taping of, uh, you know, uh, uh, for, for sports injuries uh, to even not tying, you know, knots uh, to um, basic survival stuff. But most of it's going to be in the realm of medicine, wilderness medicine, and mostly, uh, of course, revolving around herbal medicine, because that is really what this is, you know, wh where my uh, focus is always is in herbal medicine. And that is it. That is the end of the uh, first video cast. Thanks for if you've stuck around for the whole thing. Thanks for watching it this far and uh, look for many more to come. I'm not going to um, nail myself down to a schedule yet because a lot of things are starting to happen. You know, this spring will be a very busy spring, but uh, I'm going to try to uh, try to be on a regular basis to these video casts. And for right now, I'm going to say once a month because that's an easy one to keep. But I uh, wish I could do a lot more. I wish I could do this once a day. So uh, that's it. This has been Sam Kaufman, The Human Path, Herbal Medics, or, um, uh, Herbal Medics University, and thanks for watching.